Crop360 Data Engineering Team at Bear Crop Science. I'd like to personally welcome you to the Our Planet and Beyond session of Prepare.ai 2020. And I'd like to thank you for attending this talk where I'll be going over the industrialization of an agricultural genomics pipeline. Bear Crop Science is the world's leading agricultural company across product segments and geographies. In 2019, the company recorded approximately 19 billion euro in sales, selling ag over agricultural inputs represented in 143 countries. We invest over we invested over 2 billion euro core, back into core R&D in order to fuel our baseline mission, which is to deliver world class innovation while setting new standards and sustainability in digital and pioneering digital transformation in the agricultural sector. The world needs more innovation in agriculture. By 2050, it's estimated that there'll be 2 billion additional people on our planet, and that will require us to be able to produce up to 50% more food and, and feed, all against the backdrop of an almost 20% reduction in harvest losses due to climate change related transformations in the world. All in all, this sums up that we have to get significantly better at producing more output with less inputs in terms of product and land. Now, innovation in agriculture has consistently allowed us to grow more with less, essentially in a more sustainable manner. The graphic before you is one of my favorites. Each strip of land is planted using all the agricultural inputs, so seeds, traits, treatments, chemicals, and agronomic practices that had baseline availability in the year that the, uh, the year that's shown. The amount of land that you see with corn, with standing corn plants, is the amount, amount of land, uh, land taken to grow 250 kilograms of grain outputting of the plot. So essentially, every plot that you see here produced the exact same am amount of grain. Now, there is an enormous amount of innovation um, that enters into an analysis like this, both in terms of improved seed with improved genetics, novel traits, advances in uh, seed treatments and crop protection chemicals, as well as agronomic practice. Well, one thing that uh, overlies that overlays all of this, which we're going to dig into in depth today, is the same type of innovation that humanity has been essentially turning on for millennia in order to improve agricultural output, which is getting better at producing staple crops with better with better genetics for producing more of higher quality uh, with with less input genetic improvement is achieved through cycles of breeding and a cycle of breeding can be reduced to the basic schematic that you see before you it starts by creating a new breeding population this happens by picking two parents and those parents are selected for a variety of variety of different objectives and characteristics, but always some combination of bringing together attributes that positively impact productivity, quality, and resilience. So for example, perhaps one parent that's exceptionally high yielding in a certain environment, and another parent that brings with it resistance to a certain disease. The goal of the breeding pipeline is to generate a great number of progeny from those two parents and evaluate them to select the best to move forward eventually coming up with a novel product. This happens by creating a bunch of, creating a new breeding population and moving it into what we call in silico performance testing. So this means generating a wide number of progeny plants, sending them to our precision genomics laboratory capabilities to gather genotype data in the lab. So laboratory results that report on the molecular nature of the plant. And then we have the ability to feed that data into artificial intelligence-based models that are predictive of performance in order to select the best candidates to move forward to large-scale field testing. The phase of agonic performance testing plants these top candidates across a range of environments across multiple years to keep winnowing down, winnowing down the candidate pool to the ever and ever smaller number of best possible candidates. Towards the end of that pipeline, some of those candidates will cycle back and become parents in new breeding populations, perpetuating the cycle. A small number 
will eventually advance to the open market where they become new seed products that are sold to growers worldwide. And the cycle repeats itself over and over and over again. Take this in entirety over the entirety of the 40, 40 to 50 years of data that bear crop science has, this, uh, this which we call our, our galaxy, colloquially, is the entire family tree of our cord pipeline. So every node or star that you see in this graphic represents one of, one of those either corn parents or progeny. And every edge that you see in between them is a familiar relationship. So this entire family tree represents every cross, every plant, every successful commercial product and not, or, or candidate that didn't make it to market, iterated upon over and over, representing one enormously valuable and complicated data set that we can tease apart in order to gain greater insight. My team actually spent, a, an, enti uh, spent an entire talk back in 2015 talking about just the engineering and data science necessary to come up with the graphic that you see here. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, you can hop, hop out after this talk to catch that video from GraphConnect 2015. All right, so we talked about doing in silico performance testing in the lab, which really comes down to for every seed population, if we believe, and we do, that we can use genetic data to make decisions that are predictive of in-field performance, what is the best genetic characterization possible that we can use to feed into each of those decisions, i.e. the highest quality possible data results in the highest quality possible decision. So we're gonna zoom in a little bit about a little bit on the data that we collect for that in-lab screening. So what you see here is a really toy example of some of the key scientific data sets that are useful in this process. On the left, we take a little bit of a walk through the molecular data. And when I talk about molecular data or genotypes, what I'm really talking about is that in any given organism, you have a genome that's made out of varying, varying numbers, billions of A's, T's, C's, and G's. Many of you that are familiar with uh, consumer personal genomics testing like 23andMe are probably familiar or maybe even have this data set collected for yourself. So we want to observe that data. We wanna have access to as much of that data as possible to use to feed predictive models. And there are a number of ways that we can get it. So in the, la in the laboratory, there are a range of different genomics platforms that can take in a sample from a plant and report back on that data. And we roughly characterize them by either being low density, i.e. we get a little bit of data from the sample, and it's, but it's quick and cheap, or high density, i.e. it takes a lot more time and money per sample, but we get back uh, a much greater pool of data sampling the genome more finely like you see in the graphic. Now, we obviously would like to have high density data for every plant within that galaxy, but time and money makes that infeasible. It turns out, however, that we don't necessarily need to collect high density data on everything. Science has known for a long time, and we've invested a lot of effort in fine tuning this, that if we know something about the pedigree, i.e. the family tree of a seed, so what its parents are, for example, and we know a little bit of data about that progeny, that progeny itself, and perhaps some higher resolution data on its parents, we can leverage a family of techniques called genotype inference. Sometimes in the literature, this is referred to genotype imputation, but it's really statistically an inference um, as a set of analytical techniques that leverage that pedigree structure, that family tree, as well as the places along that tree in which we have observed data, either low or high density, to infer for every genomic position that we don't have an observation on, the probability of what that genotype would be with high confidence. So what this allows us to do is to essentially best leverage the data that we do collect with those family trees and that high and low density data the net effect is that we can end up with the, um, the amount and quality of high resolution data everywhere across that galaxy. And that represents an exceptionally powerful data set for turning those predictive models. Now, we've talked a little bit about the data and some of the domain that's involved. And here we take a turn to how this becomes a little bit more real. Meeting the demand for industrial scale decisions 
requires industrial scale data services, i.e. how do you even begin to conceive a pipeline or a process by which you could have inferred genotypes for billions of seeds? What would be the foundation that you'd have to lay, the foundation of industrialization? This is a challenge that bear crop science took very seriously starting four years ago. And what we did is invest in a platform that we now call Prog360, which internally to our company is a distributed data platform that characterizes each product state at every pipeline stage by providing frictionless interfaces for all of the different digital solutions in our company, web apps, mobile apps, analytical models to build on top of. Now, Product 360 decomposes the entire content of our, of our pipeline's data set. Every data set from early discovery all the way through, through to shipping a pallet of seed to a grower's field in terms of what we call resource families, large pillars organized by scientific and data, do, data domain uh, it, that play an increasing role as we move a candidate through the pipeline from discovery to sale. And those five categories are genomics, pipeline, performance, materials, and products. Again, each representing a core domain, data-specific and scientifically grounded um, in which we operate. So genomics, the molecular characterization of all pipeline-relevant organisms. Pipeline is the complete history of every pipeline entity that has gone through, gone through our, our funnel from discovery to market. Performance is the efficacy and effectiveness of each pipeline entity measured in the field, the lab, or controlled environment. Materials is the domain of the transformation of pipeline entities into sellable agronomic inputs. So how one actually goes from a high quality R&D candidate all the way to a packaged and shippable good to a grower. And products is our total catalog of agronomic solutions across the market life cycle. Each of these interoperated together represents a single connected view of our products as a system across the pipeline, or what we call Prod 360. Now, each one of those resource, resource families contains many collections. In each collection, you can think of as a data set that follows particular design conventions. Now, Prod 360 contains over 70 of these collections and growing every month as we seek to fill up the complexity of that pipeline. But I want to step back and take a look at just the key ones that are necessary for powering our example use case of genotype inference. The resource families involved in this particular analytic pro analytical problem are genomics and pipeline. And within genomics and pipeline, there are about seven key data sets and some total that come to bear. Now, each Product 360 collection represents, to be a collection, you are a data set that has a consistent schema multiple interfaces supporting different modes of access and is engineered for horizontal scale out. Each collection has a very well-defined unit of data which it operates on. So for example, going down genomics, genetic map. The genetic map resource collection simply holds the maps that our scientists have produced that tell us in what order and in what relative positions each of the genetic markers that we're screening for in the lab fall within the genome. They're the map that tells us how to meaningfully interpret where laboratory data reports on the content of an organism's genomes or marker call sets. Those are those raw observations that are coming out of the lab, both high and low density data that report on the genome. On the pipeline side, the ancestry collection is the resource that's responsible for producing that maze gal galaxy, the complete family tree of every seed that we've ever moved through our pipeline, where and when. I wanna pause for a second and focus on one of those areas because we're certainly going to get to horizontal scale out later. One of the key competitive advantages to the way that we've composed the Product 360 data services platform is what I mentioned in the previous slide. Every collection presents multiple computational interfaces for interacting with this data set um, in a way that allows our consumers, be they a human, a mobile app, a web app, or an analytical model to make their own trade-offs in complexity and performance as to how they use that data. 
Um, so how that manifests is that each one of those resource, resource collections, so say, for example, the market call sets in genomics, presents the exact same schema over a series of different interfaces, each one providing advantages and disadvantages for building certain applications. So for example, every collection will present a REST, a gRPC, a cloud event, a SQL interface, and client-side tooling. If you're building a basic web app, you might want to interact with REST resources, simple JSON over HTTP that are ubiquitous everywhere in the world. Everywhere in the world. However, if you're building a very complex analytical model that has to move a significant amount of data across the wire, you're going to want to build over a gRPC, our gRPC interfaces, which are specifically optimized to utilize low latency, high throughput protocols. Likewise, if you're doing exploratory machine, exploratory machine learning analysis, training a new model, you may simply want to run ad hoc SQL queries over the, sa over the same data sets, irrespective of, of latency. By, do, by following this design pattern, we've allowed each one of these data sets to be applicable to the largest number of uh, construction use cases possible. And it turns out that if you make these investments, uh, industrial scale divisions generate industrial scale traffic. Presenting core data sets with uh, multiple computational interfaces and ensuring horizontal scale out uh, generates a lot of traffic. In Product 360, internal to bear crop science, we commonly analyze this space in terms of churn of our pipeline in 12 month rolling intervals. And what this, when, and the data that you see here shows that essentially every month we're serving about a billion requests across almost 200 different applications. So again, these are apps and analytical models. And, uh, fit, and, and 50, 58 to 63 of those collections are active in any given month. By ER, consumers are pulling a wide variety of data as they weave it together to an ever increasingly large amount of analytical decision making. The slides that I just walked you through were uh, were uh, gone over in exceptional detail by another one of our team members last year at Cloud Next, April 2019. I really encourage you, if you want to dive into the details of how we specifically engineer these resources for horizontal scalability and sustainability across those different modes of access, to check that to check this video out after you finish this talk. Let's walk back to how do we weave this all, how do we weave these components that we talked about together to building an inference engine? So where have we left off with? Well, we know that we have labs generating observed genotype data quickly and cheaply. We know that we have a series of specialized horizontally scalable resources that will collect each one of those data sets and present them to both the systems reading and writing them as well as the analytical models that are going to produce inferences over them. So let's weave this together. Schematically, the way our infer inference engine works out as is the various workflows in our precision genomics labs that are generating observed data of different levels of, qu of quality and volume will interact with our Proc 360 resources to write their data, quality check it, and read it back for the purposes of exposing it to lab consumers. As it hits the Product 360 environment, it now becomes available to every consumer that might want to request or operate on that data set. One of those is what we call internally pedigree-based imputation. So i.e. the algorithms that take in the known ancestral data sets of each of those plants. So every plant that's coming in will have a set of genotype data now and a family tree that links back to all its ancestors and all their genotype data. It can read from those Proxy 60 resources at broad scale, crunch its output, and feed it back, feed it back into new resources that be then become available for pipeline decisions. Now, one of the complexities that we take on as a data engineering team in this is that each one of those data sets is going to have different technical needs in terms of write read performance, data set size, transactionality, so on and so forth. And we do not want our consumers to ever have to think about that. We only want them to think about, do I want to make a gRPC call, a REST call? Do I want to listen to a cloud, cloud event for asynchronous notification? All the complexity has to be ensconced inside of our platform. 
And the nature of those data sets means that our platform is heterogeneous. So inside the inference engine alone, some of these data sets are backed by a variety of databases ranging from Neo4j for, connect, for OLTP graph use cases like our insider taxonomy and ancestry data sets, Spanner, which provides the backend for most of our, our table-based OLTP transactions, or even loose cloud storage for things like amorphous large file-based large, large file data sets. The, effect, the net effect of weaving each of, the, of each of these components together in a horizontally scalable way is that we can optimize for, for peak inference engine throughput. Um, now, we don't always have to operate at, at, at scale as high as what's indicated on this particular, sl particular slide, but the advantage of being to scale up to this degree is that if we want to qualify a particular model or, how, or our scientists want to run an experiment on how they might perturb the system and want to regenerate the entire data set, the ability to do this and have this in our back pocket allows us to consider those experiments at a pretty rapid pace. Over the summer, um, we've, been long time, we've been long time users of Kubernetes and Kubernetes Engine inside of Google Cloud. So it runs our entire Pride360 platform. We partnered with uh, Google Kubernetes Engine uh, engineers to effectively orchestrate some tests of high scale up functionality in their system. Um, and the results are what you see on the slide, or you can dive into the article that we, that we published on this topic back in June. But effectively, at maximum output, those Pro360 resources and uh, analytical routines were capable of operating at a scale of 240,000 CPU cores using one and a half petabytes of memory. And that perhaps is a, you know, a technical spec, but what it really comes down to is what's on the right. The way in which that engine was constructed was such that we were paying a net cost of a cent per CPU hour, which drives the cost of, the, of this analytical operation very, very low, and we are capable of producing 15 billion genotypes per hour, which is well beyond the capacity that we need to keep turning on these types of genetic improvements. If you're curious about continuing this discussion uh, with myself or anyone from our team or just learning more about some of the content that you see here, we've left the breadcrumbs of prior talks and articles behind that I encourage you to dive into after this talk. Read, watch, take notes, ask questions. We look forward to hearing from you. I'd like to thank you for taking the time out of your day to watch this session, uh, to you know, absorb take notes. I really encourage you to hang around afterwards for the live Q&A session, and I thank you for your time. Hopefully, I'll meet some of you someday. Great. Good afternoon, and thank you all so much for joining us today for the session. Um, we appreciate having your presence here, um, and we were so thankful and lucky to have um, Tim's expertise. Um, so we will go into a live Q&A here. Um, just for reference, I'm Antoinette Boyd. I serve on the Workforce Development Committee for Prepare AI. Um, and so I'll be moderating the question and answer session for um, this afternoon. So we'll go ahead and get started. Looks like we have a couple of questions already um, in the chat. If you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. We have a few minutes here for Q&A and we're happy to address your questions or comments of discussion. Um, so the first question it looks like um, is, what are some key differentiators you see in GCP versus AWS or Azure that make it worth using versus just cloud provider? Just, excuse me, versus just one cloud provider. Sure. So hopefully everyone can hear me, see me. Um, standard, uh, standard opening to all, uh, all meetings in our, in our current state of being. Um, you know, for us, we've always approached engineering like a scientific problem you know we don't we don't necessarily choose the problem that we solve based on what instrumentation that we have we choose the instrumentation we know how to use based on the problem that we want to solve so very early on about five years ago when essentially our platform was um uh, being initiated all of our production work was in aws and then slowly over time 
especially as you know the cloud environment rapidly matured over the past five years. That's certainly true. And AWS was certainly an early early entry, but is very quickly um, being caught up to and in some cases overtaken. For us, a lot of our workloads are what I would call exceptionally data intensive. On our team, it's entirely back end, a lot of high throughput computation, a lot of high throughput transactional broad scale data systems. And in that class, there are some unique products and services that GCP offers that either A, the other two big cloud providers simply don't have, or they have a version of that would require a significantly amount of extra work to try to make work at a marginal level. So for us, it was a workload consideration. I personally think that, again, for any, for any engineering shop, even at smaller size, when you look at the benefits, uh, especially introduced by the different cloud providers offering various uh, partial to fully managed service offerings, um, the overhead that you might observe from trying to maintain more than one cloud provider can quickly be overcome um, by this, you know, by the savings and effort of choosing the right service to the right workload. So that's kind of my general take on it. And certainly if we want it to, maybe not now, we could nerd out over particular services and offerings and things we've benchmarked back and forth. Thank, Thank you, Jimmy. Okay, um, looks like we have another question here. The question is, what kinds of phenotype measurements are you taking and how are those done at scale? Okay, um, so this is, this is a really a question that could beget entire talks in and of itself and I will definitely not do justice for because I'm not a specialist in, in field equipment. We scientists internal to bear crop science take thousands of different phenotype measurements and those are chosen based on things like the crop, the type of experiment and the objective of the experiment, no different than a laboratory experiment. The geography it's in, certain measurements are more appropriate for certain geographies, i.e. where the crop is being developed, um, or whether the experiment is done in what we call open field or controlled environment, and that means essentially a greenhouse setting. Um, in all cases, at, at low to what I'll call low to medium volume, uh, for, a lot, for quite a while now, we've invested heavily in various incarnations of, of mobile equipment. So our scientists and field workers are using mobile devices, iOS and Android devices, augment it with precision GPS equipment, and then to collect measurements in the field uh, using applications that we built internally. The company has built internally designed for its experiment and its experimental parameters. At large scale, this is where things get interesting. It is an active area of, of growth of the company. Um, in many of our controlled environment operations, we utilize an extensive amount of robotically controlled imagery. So taking for certain phenotype measurements, you can take large scale images, uh, images on cameras mounted on essentially, you know, X, Y gantries over the, the, the plants. And then you can process them with a variety of machine learning techniques to extract certain phenotype measurements. The same is true in the open field. So we've done a lot of work um, and that's expanding in certain phenotypes are very amenable to being computed from images that are collected by uh, UASs, drones that are flying over fields. So at the largest possible scale, for measurements that match that mold, um, we are increasingly using robotics to collect them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Tim. That was a wonderful answer. Um, so it looks like um, that is all the questions we have so far. Um, if there's anyone who um, is on, um, on the line and they want to share a topic that was mentioned in the talk that maybe sparks their curiosity, um, we're happy to discuss in more detail, or if anyone has any additional questions, we still do have a few minutes here for Q&A. Please feel free to pop those questions into the chat. And we have Tim here, who's excellent, and he's here to, to answer any questions that you have. Doesn't look like we have any other questions um, coming in at this time, and I don't see any comments um, in the chat. Um, I don't know if just, you know, as we wait for to see if any other questions come in or just to kind of wrap things up, I know this is a pretty complex topic and like you talked about can be um, viewed from a bunch of different lenses. Um, is there a key takeaway from, from your talk that you'd like people to know? Oh, wow. So I, um, what I find, what I think is an interesting takeaway from the talk is actually 
kind of the messaging and some of the, the intro material, which is something that motivates me quite a bit, is I, I, I think a lot of people that um, don't have any background or not, are not really familiar with the way at which agricultural development works or crop science operates, or, or they were in life sciences, but everyone likes, likes human life science. It's, it's the more popular side. I, I think it's very, it's very fascinating to be introduced to the sheer scale at which uh, crop improvements gone on, even in essentially the lifetimes of our parents and grandparents. The pace has really accelerated quite a bit. And what I find fascinating about that is the, the role of what we would call, you know, software engineering, data science, machine learning has taken off in agriculture. I would wager again, you know, maybe me and my friends that went to, you know, clinical genomics could argue about this has probably accelerated quicker in agriculture than it has on the human, on the human side. I think the level of innovation and ingenuity that's happened is, is quite profound. And I think if you, if you find yourself in a field where you, you like quantitative work, you like software engineering, data science, analysis, uh, life sciences of any kind or physical sciences, there's a whole lot of really meaningful global scale problems that you can work on in the sector. Um, and I find that fascinating. Most people that I talk to, I mean, obviously I attend a lot of software engineering conferences and, and, and data science conferences. Um, and for the audience that has no background in agriculture, I think that's usually a quite fascinating thing to be, to be introduced to. Yeah, it's certainly fascinating to me, and I don't have an agri agricultural background, so thank you so much for sharing that. Um, it doesn't look like we have any additional questions, so um, we can go ahead and wrap up the session. We want to thank you so much, Tim, for your expertise and for um, sharing your time this afternoon to answer some questions from the participants. Um, and our participants, we thank you all for joining us for the session, and we look forward to seeing you at future sessions and future Prepare AI um, events throughout the month. Thank you. Stay around and I'll, I'll, I'll answer the rest of the questions on the chat too. Oh, am I missing some? Oh no, there's just some in the in the open chat window, so I got it. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I thought I updated it. I didn't see any. Ah, it's just back and forth. Okay. I can see those questions now on the Whova, Whova website. I didn't see them on the app. Um, so I don't know if you wanna answer any of those um, live. We oh, yeah. Certainly, we have a few more minutes. I apologize, I missed those. Um, so it looks like there's a question. Um, what new technologies are you excited about? Any adoption of long red sequencing? Oh, wow, where'd that come in? Oh, that came in. Oh, oh what? just a couple minutes ago. Um, there's one. A what? Follow up question along, to, along those lines. Are you focusing mostly on mostly SMPs? Are also things like CNVs, which are especially prevalent in plants, of course. On the, the new technology front, that's that's a, a fun line to go down. On the laboratory side, I mean, we our la our sequencing labs have traditionally used every sequencing technology that's available. Like we've always invested heavily in it. Um, and long reads are, I think long reads are still, I mean, this is probably an, an argument depending on, on who you want to address in the scientific community. They are still fantastic and the, the technology to beat for large scale, high quality genome assembly. And that is, that is a fact. Um, so we're, we, we utilize them heavily and I think they're gonna play a, a major role for a long time. Um, on the on the sequencing side, certainly, like we have, we I'm really excited about the evolving concept um, again, which is not necessarily new in the world, but I think is perhaps getting a new life with new or, organism organism problems to be applied to. Are things like various incarnations of short read sequencing that are designed to be tunable, so effectively to allow you to explicitly make a trade off between the amount of um, the amount of information you get out of the experiment, like the density of data versus the cost and speed at which you measure it, which you measure it. Um, and that has a big implications for us because we are constantly trying to, to tune and ask questions on. If you remember back to that, the big galaxy I mentioned in the slide, we obviously, we would love to have super expensive to gather high quality data on every possible plant. But then of course the company would go bankrupt very quickly. Um, and there's a trade-off between 
uh, wanting to gather the best data possible versus the amount of actual usable information you get out of it. Does it really help you make a decision? And what I find really fascinating is uh, there's a good group of people that are investing heavily in the idea of being able to match the resolution that we get out of sequence data and the cost we put into it versus the information that we get out of it, depending on what our scientific objective is. So I find that fascinating. Okay, so it looks like we got to those last couple of questions that were um, in the chat. Um, unless there's any final questions, we will go ahead and wrap up. And again, thank you so much, Tim, for um, your expertise and um, in hosting a session and then also being available here um, live on Q&A um, to answer questions from attendees. Um, as I mentioned before, we, we have um, events happening throughout the month and we hope to see you at future sessions. Have a good afternoon and thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.